This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. The information presented on this program is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult an appropriate professional for guidance about your concerns. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. Welcome to AutoCorrect, helping you correct your auto problems. Our host is usually Coach Charlie Milton, ASC Certified Master Technician. I'm Liz Gill, but Coach has gone fishing. So today we've brought in our regular contributor, Auto Casey, Casey Williams. You can see him on YouTube, and we feature him doing a review each week on this show. And today, we're going to talk all about safety features that new cars have. So email all those repair questions, auto at mpbonline.org. We'll get Coach on those when he gets back. But bring on your collision mitigation braking system and lane keeping assist questions or ask about some of the newest models and uh, Casey can talk with that. Casey, we're so glad that you're with us. Hello. Hey, Liz. Thanks for having me. It's always a great time. Oh, well, we are very, very glad that you are here. And, you know, it is interesting just the plethora of all these new car systems that there are. I had not realized, uh, you know, until I got a, I got a new Honda CRV, and it just has tons of stuff. And I was so, you know, surprised about it. And, you know, before I was a little bit skeptical about it, but now I'm loving it. I don't feel like I'm being uh, dragged in one way or the other. What is your opinion overall on all of the new safety features? I think the engineers and designers have done a real good job of integrating those systems in a way that they just kind of act in the background. They don't really bother your everyday driving but they're standing by in case in case they need to intervene. You know, I think back when I started reviewing cars 25 years ago, I would write about how many airbags were in the car and if it had anti-lock brakes or traction control. And today, you know, the list of safety systems, you know, it's, it's, you know I'm looking at a list in front of me, it's, it's 30 items on that list of different systems a car can have, and it's even not comprehensive at that. So I, I think, I think you know, people, people get nervous about them, but they just kind of stay in the background and they keep an eye on the road and keep an eye around the car and, and can intervene if necessary. All right. So most everybody has the back. Well, the backup cameras now are standard. Uh, I guess, yes. what is it, since like 2019? Yeah, it's been a few years. But yeah, they're standard now. And, you know, the, the, the airbags are all standard. But then there's other things. Like, tell us about the tire pressure monitoring system. <laughs> yeah, you know, in the old days... Again, you know, you go out, you look at the tire, maybe you put a tire gauge on it and you kept driving the car. Um, but today it keeps track and within a pound or two, you know, pressure inside the tire, it'll tell you that it's low. So it gives you a good heads up that your tire is getting low, gives you plenty of time to get off the highway or go find a gas station to pump it up and, and keep it right. Um, they're also really good if you have a blowout. You know, a lot of the new run flat tires, you can't can't really tell immediately that the tire is getting flat because it'll continue to kind of suspend the car. Um, so it just it just tells you that immediately. When, when I hit the tire pressure gauge, it's usually is when I have a blowout, and it, it's the first thing to go off, and then I start hearing the tire clunk. But uh, it, it's just a great system. And, you know, now that you mentioned that, uh, you need to know if you've got a spare or not in your vehicle or your <laughs> rental. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, if, if, if not, you know, get the get the inflator can. But but again, for me, it seems like when I need the inflator can, I've done more damage to the tire that, that that'll, that that'll can fix and I have to have it towed. One thing I haven't played too much with is the Apple CarPlay Android Auto. I guess my Honda 
you can't do, you can't manipulate the navigation app while you're running. But I think if you plug in your phone and you have the the Apple or the Android, it has its own navigation and then it can pull up all your little saved things that's on your phone. Talk about the, some of the, the suite of features that if you have this uh, plug-in, Apple Play and Android. Yeah, I use Apple CarPlay all the time. And what I really like is, is that no matter which car I'm in, I plug my phone in and it's the same screen inside the car. So if I drive a new Mercedes S-Class or if I drive, you know, a Hyundai, it's exactly the same screen, same setup, same access to my music library. You know, the, it works very much like your phone does to, to do your maps and to do navigation. It also brings in your phone contacts and it remembers those after it downloads them. So I, I can go from car to car and it's just pretty much seamless from vehicle to vehicle. But it, and, and it's just very intuitive. I, I, honestly, I think Apple and Android both do a lot of times a better job than the automakers do on their own systems. Well, you know, reinventing the wheel. If you if you stay in, or I guess it's stay in your lane. If uh, Apple and Android have already perfected this, then it would behoove the automakers to just let you them let people bring their software. Yeah, it it, it just plugs right in. It's easy, and 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 also you know you a lot of times I'll be in the house and I'll set up my 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 route on my phone. And then I go out to the car, just plug it straight in, and it just goes right into the car, and it's great. We're talking about new safety features and feature features that are on the new cars. We've got our good friend Casey Williams here with us. We'd love for you to send us an email. That address is auto at mpbonline.org, or it's a call-in show. We'd love to get your voice and your questions or hear about your experiences. Our phone number is one 877 MPB ring that works out to be 1-877-672-7464. Now, this is a feature I hadn't really heard much about until I got it on my car, and there were all these beepings when I'm backing out of a parking lot, is that the rear cross-traffic monitor. Uh, Share a little bit about that. Yeah, that's kind of grown out of what used to just be like little sonar sensors, you know, you'd back in and not hit a concrete barrier or something. Um, but the rear cross path, it is essentially looking in both directions, you know, as you're backing out perpendicular to the car. So it'll it'll beep and detect when a when a uh, car is coming down the street. Um, the more sophisticated versions even have an auto braking system on the back. So if you don't put the brake on, the car will go ahead and brake too. And it's just a great safety system. And, and not only for cars, but, the, you know, again, more advanced ones have pedestrian detection. So if there's a kid playing behind you, there's a dog behind you, you know, bicycle stand behind you, it'll detect those and auto brake too. Yeah, I like it. It even, mine kind of changes color on the screen. It goes orange if there's something in the way. And I think there's even an arrow that tells you what direction somebody is coming from. Yeah, Honda does that. And then and then General Motors has um, their safety alert seats. And it'll even vibrate the seat in the direction of that danger. So, it's, <laughs> so, it's even, so, so it'll def, it will definitely get your attention. The heads-up display will, will make lights and stuff too. So it'll, it'll get your attention. The heads-up display, you know, you've you've mentioned that. Uh, that is not anything that I have much experience with. Uh, enlighten me about a heads-up display. So what it, there's two different types. So one of them, it reflects off the windshield, and then there's some simpler ones that there's a little plastic piece on top of your dashboard, and it'll put it up there. Um, but the more sophisticated ones, when you're driving the car, you look at it, it looks like a digital speedometer, your navigation instructions are hovering out over the end of the hood. Just straighten your line of sight. You know, my, my parents hate it. You know, my parents will drive on my test cars, and they absolutely hate it. But I love it. And, and, and the technology has been around a long time. I mean, General Motors started developing it in the 1960s, introduced it on the Oldsmobile Cutlass pace car in 1988. You know, Oldsmobile Cutlass, Pontiac Grand Prix had that system. Corvettes had it for a number of years. So it, it's, it's great. I, I like it a lot with uh, speed. I like with the navigation instructions if I'm in the city trying to find off-ramps. And, and then also, you know, if you drive a performance car, to have the tachometer in front of you is very nice, too. Well, Jay White, we should do a uh, mashup show with autocorrect everyday tech and, relatively speaking, talking about the <laughs> ability that our more mature Americans feel with their embrace <laughs> of technology. I know that was something my mom just hated when they'd come out with a, a new Kindle or a new update. <laughs> yeah. It was something she really had trouble embracing. 
Yeah, we could. That's the crossover. I don't think we knew we needed. But now, <laughs> but now, now we do. We, we do. And, you know, uh, Casey's parents not really loving that heads up display, which, man, that's putting me in the middle of Mario Kart or something like that. Right. I, I guess Mario Kart is. 2008 so I oh no that's still that's still do they do the kids still do mario kart that's as fresh as could be right now yeah all right if you've got a repair question you've got to send an email that email address is auto at mpbonline.org if you want even more autocorrect find our podcast on all podcasting platforms for your smart device autocorrect is heard on mpb think radio thursdays at 10 a.m with a replay saturdays at 11 Here are some recent recalls. The 21 and 22 variants of the Cadillac Escalade, Chevrolet Suburban and Tahoe, and GMC Yukon and Yukon LX for faulty rivets in the seat belt assemblies. The 22 Ford Maverick. Now, in July, there was a recall for a potential engine compartment fire risk. Now it's the side curtain airbags. Ferraris from the last 17 model years are being recalled for risk of brake failure and some 19 through 22 Mitsubishi Outlander sports are being recalled for stalling issues. You can always find out if your car has a past recall by going to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's website, NHTSA, nhtsa.gov slash recall. Just input your VIN or find their Safer Car app. We're talking about the latest safety features on vehicles and taking your questions, maybe about recent model year vehicles or how you like your safety accoutrements, your accessories. No vehicle repair questions today since Coach is out, but our email for those is auto at mpbonline.org. All right, Casey, one thing that I love, and, you know, we're on the interstate from time to time, is adaptive cruise control. Ooh, ah. Tell me, tell us about that. That's one of my favorite. I, I like adaptive cruise control. My our, our family car has it, and I use it all the time. So adaptive cruise control, it uses radar, lasers, or cameras, depending on the automaker and sophistication. And what it'll do is it, it keeps you a safe distance from the car in front of you. So in the old days, you'd set your cruise, and you'd have to either get into the left lane or you'd turn the cruise off to adjust your speed or you'd tap it up and down on speed. Um, but the adaptive cruise control does that completely automatically. And, you know, that's really kind of an outgrowth of the automatic emergency braking systems that would detect a car, detect an object, detect a pes- pedestrian, the more sophisticated ones, and auto brake. So it's using those, those sensors to do that. And then automakers like General Motors, their next generation, they're going a step further um, with their system like Super Cruise, where it's a hands-off system on designated highways. So they, they limit where you can use it, where it's safe to use it. Um, but on those designated highways, you can take your hands off the steering wheel and the car will keep itself steered. Um, if you drive like a Cadillac Escalade, you can even put your turn signal on it. It will move the car over to the left-hand lane and center itself. And it'll, it'll, it'll adjust for you know construction zones and all that. The less sophisticated systems, you still kind of have to steer to stay their lane and let it center. But very cool. I mean, I sat on the highway for, you know, a better part of an hour with my hands off the steering wheel in a Cadillac, just watching the world go by. Um, they have they have a camera. They make sure that you're watching the road so it's so it's not unsafe to use and they make sure you're being safe. Um, but just very sophisticated and just, just makes your life a lot easier on the highway. Yeah, I love the sci-fi movies that show, oh, like... Um... A minority report or something, the ones yeah. that, you know, you just get in the car and you can sit there and have your lunch and carry on a conversation. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. We're not there yet. At, but so if you have the adaptive cruise control, you might think, wait a second, why am I slowing down from what I was set at? So you have to pay attention. It, it behooves you to pay attention, you know, oh, maybe I should pass them or uh, whatever, but it, it's we're not uh, we're not getting rid of uh, you know paying attention for driving yet. Yeah, no, none of these systems allow the driver to just take a nap and read a book. You have to pay attention. They're they're aids to help you drive safer. Great. Well, we have 
a call on the line, and we are, oh, we're trying to, we're getting Walker on the line. Walker, we're glad you, you've called in to autocorrect today with Casey Williams. What's your question or comment? Well, uh, you referred to a, a category of driver earlier as a mature driver. That'd be me. I'm 75, and uh, I really hate tailgaters. I'm wondering if this uh, system of uh, automatic braking when you get too close to the car in front of you would prevent people from tailgating you. Not not as it's currently designed, but that's, that might be a really good idea, though. <laughs> Ooh, if, if you could make the car behind you slow down, that would be good. That would be great. You know, when, when, they're, when they're talking about automated cars, you know, in the next 10 years or so, those kinds of systems where cars talk to each other and talk to infrastructure and keep safe distances, those systems will come but they're not, not currently on the vehicles. Well, as a mature driver, we used to do that all the time. There were courteous drivers on the road. You wanted to change lanes, you'd put your blinker on, they'd flash their light, slow down, and let you in. Yeah. Now that's not so common anymore, and uh, sometimes you just have to pull over in front of somebody, and if they have this automatic braking, perhaps that would back them off. Another good idea I might have is what I do when I try to get someone to back off is to put on my flashers, and half the time, you know, they're aware enough and they'd back off. But uh, it's, if there was an automatic system where the radar in back would be able to tell the distance and the speed you're going and whether it's unsafe and would automatically uh, put on a, a, a strobe light uh, in the eyes of the person that was tailgating you, uh, that might be a good idea, too, whether it's the, you know, the police blue or red or, or white. Just you know, wake somebody up and say, hey, you're too close. Walker, yeah. I think you've got a, a, a job, a second career as a consultant. Well, I'll let y'all pass it along. I'm retired. <laughs> I like the idea. I think that's cool. Great. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks, Walker. Thanks, Walker. Kind of dovetailing into that uh, is the forward forward collision warnings. Tell us about that type of uh, safety feature, Casey. Yeah, again, it's using it's using the systems for adaptive cruise and for the auto brake system, um, but it's just it's the initial warning where it'll. You know, blink a red light. So, so some of some of the cars just have that red light in the front. Um, my Subaru actually has a light that will flash with, without the full heads-up display. Um, so so it'll, it'll 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 warn you that way. Sometimes it's a it's an you know it's a beep or a buzz that will tell you. But 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 it's designed to get your attention. And, you know, and when Walker was talking, it's like you know again some of the more sophisticated cars, the driver behind them would have gotten that warning saying you know back off a little bit. And I guess that's what's interesting. They have. The ability for first you might get a light, you might get a bell, and then the car might take control of itself if there is a, a warning. So it's like kind of a, a three-step process maybe or two steps. Yeah, the first the first, first is to get your attention and have you take care of the problem. And, and, and if you don't, then the car will you know go ahead and do it for you. All right, so collision mitigation braking system. So I guess the first you get a warning, but then what exactly is a collision mitigation braking system? Yeah, that's what we're talking about with the automatic emergency braking. So again, it's using those systems. It's detecting from, from your speed and the vehicle speed in front of you or an object that you're likely to collide with it if brakes are not applied immediately. And if you don't, it'll, it'll go ahead and apply those brakes. And, and it's a system we were talking about, you know, more mature drivers. My my mother-in-law and father-in-law have automatic emergency braking on their car, and they wanted it. You know, they live they live in Dallas. They're on the freeway often even. And, you know, you turn around to, to look to get over to the next lane, and somebody pulls in front of you. You know, kind of like what Walker said, people just cut you off. And and if you didn't have a system like that, you, you would never see it before before you hit the car in front of you. And, you know, while you're looking over your shoulder, the car's still watching the road in front of you. And, and, and I've been in cars where... You know the brakes. The, the brakes are on before I even realized something's happened. You know the car just went ahead and did it. And I, I, so so glad it happened. I would have had an accident. So some of the you mentioned a little bit earlier. Some of the safety features are keeping you in your lane, and you know I guess one level is lane keeping assist system. What is that about? So there's there's really two levels. It's kind of like the forward collision alert. Um, a lot of cars have lane departure warnings, less sophisticated, where they will they will buzz, they will beep. Um, some of them will kind of vibrate the steering wheel a little bit. You know, General Motors cars, again, the safety alert state, it'll, it'll vibrate those seats. So that, again, just kind of the initial warning. Um, and then if you don't take action, uh, the car, 
depending on the sophistication of the car, there, it can either apply brakes to kind of drag it back into the lane, it, and the more sophisticated ones will actually put steering inputs in to just kind of bump back into the lane. And again, it's not it's not steering enough to like you know upset the car or move you two lanes over. It's just enough to kind of nudge it back into the lane. But you know, often again, it's those are the systems where I thought I don't need these systems. I've been driving enough years. I don't. Why do I need this? And it's surprising to me how often you know I nudge a line or go over a line on the highway when I'm just kind of work, you know, playing the radio or changing, changing something or changing the climate control. You just don't realize how often you kind of nudge those lines and do that until, until the car has that system and you feel the steering wheel vibrator, you know, kind of feel the car nudge itself back over. Yeah, that, yeah, that exactly. I guess that started on the roads, a lot of places on the interstates having the rumble, rumble strips, strips yeah. <laughs> on the side. And then you'd go, oh, wait a second, I'm scooting over but now we've got these you know lane keeping assist and i guess you know there's every model has different words i guess the road departure mitigation that's where it was is that where it would pull you over yeah yeah there's there's two ways of doing it. they can either in more sophisticated cars can actually get, put a steering input so the car steers itself back into the lane of centers or or it can actually kind of it, it'll break the outside wheels to kind of pull the car over without steering inputs and just kind of nudge it back in that way too. And, and some cars have both systems on them. We've got a question. Let's go to Houston. Now that's Houston, Mississippi, Casey. And we've got <laughs> Jim. Jim, what's your comment or question on our safety feature show? Good morning. I, this is not exactly a safety feature, but I would I have a question about how plug-in hybrids work. Uh, in particular, I live out in the country. And I was thinking, could I, could I, is there a switch I could, is there some way I could have it turn off the electric part and ride on gasoline till I get to two flow and then save my battery for the city driving? Because that's where the, the battery, the electric driving really pays off, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's really a good question. Um, I've driven several of the plug-in hybrids, and many of them do have a switch where you can save the save the battery for city driving. Excellent. Um, and, for the reasons, for, and probably for the reason you're thinking that you're on the interstate, you're running 70 miles per hour, you, you would go through that battery in just seconds, especially just a plug-in hybrid, not a full electric. Yes. So, yeah, that's exactly exactly what you can do. There's a, there's a, there's a, most of them have switches in the console where you can press it and save it. So that would be a better thing than for a country boy like me than a regular hybrid, it seems. I would, about two-thirds of the time, I don't really need the electric. Yeah, I think, I think plug-ins, especially if you're in the country, are a really good choice, maybe even better than a full electric car. Because you could, you know, you can probably run into town. You can do your errands on electric. A lot of them is kind of that 15 to 30 miles all electric range if they're if they're plugged in and charged. Yes. So you can do that. But then, then you want to get on the highway and drive far. If you live, you know, live kind of in a rural rural place, you need to drive a lot of miles to get into town. You, you've got the gas backup to do that. And I could go to Jackson and then switch back to electric and then run out of electricity and come back home on gasoline. It's exactly exactly what it's designed for. That's a, that's a great way of using it. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, you. Thank, thanks thank for the call, Jim. Thanks, Jim. And, and it's great that we've got options. You know, our last show, we were talking about diesel, and diesel might be a great option for some people who live in certain areas with certain driving uh, uh, characteristics, but not good for others. So it is fantastic that we do have so many options, and you really just have to find out what's best for what your day-to-day or what your task you want to buy your vehicle for. And that's where Casey's reviews come in great. We are not taking your vehicle repair questions today since Coach is out, but you can send those to our email address, auto at mpbonline.org. But we are learning about the latest safety features available and can take your questions about the hundreds of vehicles Casey has reviewed. Auto Casey from YouTube. I hope you have downloaded our app for your smartphone, the MPB Public Media app. You can listen to our shows, read the news, watch MPB TV shows, and you can click that support button and make a contribution to support Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Autocorrect is heard on MPB Think Radio Thursdays at 10 a.m. with a replay Saturdays at 11. So in the news, on August 16th, 2022... The Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 was enacted and amends the Qualified 
plug-in electric drive vehicle credit. And now it's known as the clean vehicle credit, and it adds new requirements for final assembly of vehicles in North America to get that credit. And additional provisions are going to go into effect January 1st of 2023. Further guidance on these provisions is forthcoming, but you can find inf- more information about the credit from the Internal Revenue Service, and I'll have that on the information for this show's podcast. So, Casey, this is the credit if you buy some kind of electric vehicle you get some money back from the IRS, but it's a little different now. What do you have to say? Yep. The first thing, my understanding is that in the past, it was a tax credit. Um, In the future, it's going to be kind of an upfront rebate, so you'll get that money faster. Um, But it's really, as it was in the past, designed to spur EV production in the United States and to spur battery production in the United States and move that technology here from, from other places. Um, So some of the requirements, you know, the vehicles have to be assembled in the United States. But, you know, that's a very long list of vehicles. I mean, or or I think it's I think it's actually North America, but, you know, the Audi Q5. Yeah, North America, because there are some that are assembled in Mexico that qualify. Yeah, Mexico and Canada as well. Yep. So the Audi Q5 makes that target. Um, The the BMW 3 Series plug-in, the Chevy Bolts, Ford Mustang Mach-E, Jeeps, Hummer, the Lucid Air, all the Tesla models. And the next year, the Cadillac Lyric and Mercedes EQS SUV. So those all are American or North American made. Um, but there are going to be some other requirements, too, that come along with this. So it'll be a maximum price of $55,000 for cars, maximum $80,000 for SUVs. So before, people could buy $150,000 Teslas or Lucid Airs and, and get, a dis- get the discount. That won't be the case in the future. Um, they're going to add requirements for you know which components are made in North America, um, 2023 has to be half of them made in North America, rising to 100% by 2029. Um, looking at even the metals and the batteries, where they're coming from, they have to be from, from North America, a free trade partner. And then there's an income limitation now. So couples making more than $300,000 won't be able to, individuals making more than $150,000, and that becomes a becomes part of a requirement too. So if you're wealthy and you're buying your $150,000 Lucid Air, might, might be out of luck on this one. Um, but they're also adding used car credits. So it's a $4,000 credit on used cars up to $25,000. And, and of course, there's income requirements there too. So a little more, little more fluid. Um, you know, a couple of the automakers, General Motors, Tesla, had made enough vehicles that they'd actually produced out of that credit. So if they made, it was several hundred thousand vehicles, but they, they had exceeded that. So if you bought a Cadillac Lyric next year, you wouldn't be able to get that anyway. Or if you bought a Chevy Bolt this year, you wouldn't be able to get it in Tesla's, of course. So they, it brings those back into the fold, too, where GM can GM test can get those discounts for their customers. Pretty neat. Yep. We're talking about the latest safety features available, but also taking your questions about new model vehicles. Email us your questions, auto at mpbonline.org. Let's go to Hernando and speak with Mike. Mike, we're glad you've called into AutoCorrect today to speak with Auto Casey. What's your comment or question? Casey, uh, a comment and then a point. Um, I've had 35 cars in the last 50 years and driven everything from high performance to everything else. And I'm extremely interested now in the change of events with EVs, electric vehicles. I love them and want one now that the recharging uh, capability of them up to 800 watts is going to mean fast charging. But here's the point. It's a nightmare. I live in a city of 35,000 people, and we have one recharging station behind a hotel. Here's the problem. You drive any gas-powered car now into a smaller town that you don't even know, and you'll spot one or two at least gas stations because of the signage. No one standardized any way of letting the drivers know that there's an electrical charge place uh, anywhere in the town. You can't spot it a quarter of a mile down the highway, and it's awful to have to drive around a town where you don't even know where you are and try to find one behind a hotel, behind a a business. Is there any effort being made by the federal government to come up with a standardized sign system so that we know when we're 200 miles from our home that we can find a charging station and then charge and get back home? So I think they're they're working on that, but there's a couple of other couple other ways of doing it now. One, the charging companies comes out of those chargers. They have apps, so you can so you can do that on your app as well. 
Um, and then some of the car, most electric cars have that built into the navigation system where it, it knows its current range, it knows where the charging stations are, and it will route you to those as well. And it'll bring them up on the, on the navigation map. Yeah, I know Tesla does. I know that for a yeah. fact. But, you know, if you don't have a, a phone with, you, they haven't downloaded the app. You're going to screw around some town. If I drive out to New Albany yeah. or down to Columbus, I'm having to drive around and figure out, well, yeah, I've, I've driven 200 miles. I've got to get back home. Where am I going to charge this thing? I mean, there needs to be some sort of signage like gas stations have now where a quarter of a mile down the road you can spot it and think, oh, good, there's a place to charge. Well, on the um, interstate, that, Mike, you know, they have a lot of those signs that say food and gas or Sonic or McDonald's or hotels. We'll have to get the charging companies to add a little sign. But that's just if you're on, you know, the interstate and we just have them kind yeah, of the main, crisscrossed. The main yeah, that, that's that's my point. I don't think I mean, new cars, electric cars are coming on the market like crazy. There's a new one introduced, it seems like every week. But for those of us that want to buy one, I'm like, the holdup for me is trying to find a place to charge the stupid thing when I don't have a – and I'll have a home charger. But when I'm driving from here to, say, Jackson, I'm like, oh, great, now where along the way might I want to charge? I know the federal government has got to step up at some point in NHTSA and come up with a system. But for now, that's a hindrance for me, and that's what's keeping me from buying one. I love the idea, but it's keeping me from buying an electric vehicle. So, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think uh, that's been one of the biggest complaints from EV owners. And again, I think, I think if you own a Tesla, you know, the, their system's very well known and very well laid out. I think the other is you've got to get the apps, and there's and there's multiple different companies that do it. ChargePoint does it. There's others, so you kind of you kind of have to kind of get in their ecosystem and use their and use their apps. And and I think those people who kind of tap into that, it works out pretty well for them. But but it's it's confusing. It's difficult. And it, honestly, it honestly, really I think I think we're. I know. Yeah. I know we're at the beginning of a technology that's going to change. Gas stations weren't prolific at the beginning of the 20th century. So I know it will change. But right now, I want an electric car, but it keeps me from buying one, thinking I don't dare drive it more than 50 miles from my house. So I, I know it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's my, a matter of patience. Yeah, my, my assumption is that the gas stations, truck stops will all have chargers, and we'll start that migration from all gas to all mostly electric at some point soon, too. So you know, you'll see the Flying J truck stop as you're going down the road. and. And, and you'll know that they've got electric charging stations and you'll go in charge. Mike, did you have a second question? No, it's just a complaint. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll do what we can. <laughs> oh, thank you, guys. I appreciate you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. We, you know, we've talked a little bit about the, the cruise control and some of the braking and the lane assist systems. Let's move on to headlights. There's, I guess there's two different ways of newfangled uh, accessories for your headlights. There's the regular headlights and also the high beams. Yeah, so, you know, we're talking about adaptive headlights, talking about automatic high beams. And these things are getting a lot of discussion now. But honestly, we've had these for a very long time. You know, the 1948 Tucker had, you know, headlamp, had, had a center headlamp that swerved with the, with the front wheels and went around corners the same way that the modern ones do. Um, to today, you can, you know, modern cars can do that with LEDs that, you know, also can adapt their beam, you know, depending on what's coming and depending on what objects are heavy. So they're very complicated. But, but you know, that, that kind of technology has been a real long time. And and if you go, you know, to an antique car show and start looking at 1950s Cadillacs, you'll often see this little metal pod on the dashboard, and you're like, what is that strange looking thing? And it was it was a headlamp dimmer. You know, it was a 1950s electronic headlamp dimmer. So. These technologies have been around a long time, but they haven't really been commonplace until the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, the, the automatic headlamp dimmers, you know, cars come in, it automatically turns off the bright so the other car doesn't get blinded. And, and then some of the more sophisticated ones can actually leave bright lights on and turn off individual lights to keep that person from getting blinded. Jason Klein and I were talking in the hall earlier today. He loves the blind spot detection that, uh, and my car has it also on the, the side view mirrors to yeah. let you know something is there. Yeah, another one of those systems where you know it uses the cameras and the sensors to to tell you that somebody's there. And and again, it's another one of those systems. I how it surprises me how often that the lights either flash in the mirrors or I'll hear the beep. And I and I didn't even realize somebody was there. Um, you know, in fact, it happened to me on the interstate last night. I was getting ready to get over into a lane and 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 it beeped and buzzed. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even didn't even see the car. So yeah, that's, it's a it's a great system. What is the pedestrian detection? Uh, I haven't heard of this one. What What is a pedestrian detection? 
Yeah, that's part of the forward collision warning and auto brake systems. So when they first came out, they really only detected large objects like a car, and they didn't detect bicyclists and pedestrians. So the more sophisticated versions detect kids, detect people walking, detect you know bicycles. So just 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 a little more sophisticated, able to see the smaller objects, and you, and that's really what you want. If you if you look at these systems and you're buying a new car. The, the automakers are quick to call out. They're very proud of their systems that do detect bicycles and pedestrians. So you'll do that, but make sure you look for a system that does detect those. Here's a new car review from Casey Williams. It's Auto Casey on AutoCorrect. A couple of weeks ago, we shared the new Kia EV6 electric crossover, and we liked it a lot. But I recognize not everybody's ready for a fully electric car. The vehicle we have this week might be a better choice. It's a 2023 Kia Sportage Hybrid. And the outside of it looks electric. It's very futuristic with the boomerang driving lamps and LED headlamps. I like that a lot. And moving inside, I like the EV6. It's got the same twin screen arrangement. You've got heated seats, a heated steering wheel, and all the crash avoidance systems. I think most people like that a lot. Under the skins where it starts to get interesting. They made a 1.6 liter turbocharged four cylinder engine with the batteries and motors to deliver 227 horsepower. So it's a pretty peppy vehicle, especially with all wheel drive and you still get 38 miles per gallon in the city and 38 on the highway. A very nice combination. So let's talk about price. The Sportage starts just under $26,000. This one fully equipped, $33,860. Autocorrect is heard on MPB Think Radio Thursdays at 10 a.m. with a replay Saturdays at 11. I'm Liz Gill. Our expert is usually Coach Charlie Melton, ASC Certified Master Technician. Today we've got Casey Williams. Auto Casey from YouTube is joining us to talk about safety features and other technologies. So I'm going to spend my lunch hour getting my hair done. And it's in an area where I'm going to have to parallel park. Now, I used to live in Chicago. I feel like I'm the queen of the parallel <laughs> parkers. But my new car does have a parking assist system so I need to read the manual and figure out how to do it. Tell us about the different gradations of parking assist ability these cars have now. Yeah, Liz, I'm kind of like you. I think I've been driving long enough that I've learned how to parallel park. I'm not very good at backing, but I can parallel park good. Um, but there are different systems. You know, you've talked about the backup cameras and the parking sensors that will help you. So you can use those. The camera especially, you know, will help guide you into that spot and show you where you are and make sure you don't hit anything. Um, but But there are more sophisticated systems that will automatically steer the vehicle into the spot. So you, you pull up next to the spot. Um, it actually can detect how big that spot is as you drive by it. And the car can give you an alert, tells you that the spot's big enough for you to fit in it. And then you pull up next, engage the system, and it'll back itself into that spot. So it, it's pretty pretty incredible. It can do it parallel. A lot of the systems can do a perpendicular parking as well. And, and the one that I really like is that the Kia electric car we had a few weeks ago you can actually use your key fob to back your car into the garage or a tight parking spot. So, you know, again, my, my garage is very tight. Back the car in. I'm not very good at backing, so I thought I'd just let the car do it. You press the button on the key fob, and it will use its sensors and, and back itself right in. And just super, super cool. I have found out three family members, three immediate family members have lost side view mirrors backing out of their <laughs> uh, garages in the past in, frequently. In the in the in the in the recent past, <laughs> it happens. It yeah, happens a yeah. lot. <laughs> I tend to take out bushes, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at on Thursdays at eleven o'clock, we broadcast Southern Remedy and its kids and teens. And Doctor uh, Morgan McLeod was a guest on AutoCorrect one time, talking about kids and cars. This rear occupant alert that sounds like a fantastic new safety feature. Yeah, I wrote a story not long ago about about kids' safety for for Chicago Tribune, in fact, and and it's so important. You know, kids you hear all the time they're left in the back seats. It's a hot day. You know, they die or get sick from being in the back seat. So a lot of the automakers, almost all of them now, either have a sensor. The more sophisticated ones have a sensor in the seat that detects it. Um, Hyundai, Kia are using some cameras to detect movement in the back seat to give you that alert. And and at, and at the minimum, automakers will. The, the car keeps track of doors opening and closing, and as you get out, it'll give you an alert that, hey, I think somebody's in the back seat. If you if you open and close it and put your, you know, your book bag in the back seat, it'll alert you to that too. But, but, but at least it gives you that warning. And, and my daughter always laughs about because she's sitting in the back seat and the car's dinging as we're getting ready to go into a restaurant. She's like, what's that? I said, I said, well, it's telling me that you're in the back seat. <laughs> but, but yeah, she always, 
that those systems are really, really important. And for folks who may be doing the car seats that uh, latch lower anchors and tethers for children, that should help you keep your car seat safe. We've got a last call for the show. It's Alec from Clinton. Alec, we're glad you've called in to autocorrect. What's your comment or question? Right. I was just going to respond to the gentleman from above New Albany who asked about the places to uh, charge cars. I'm in my brand new, to me, plug-in hybrid which was is a 2019 so used car, but the salesman uh, at the Hyundai place, and it is a Hyundai, oh, he had all kind of online sites, and you can get them on your phone and everything, uh, to tell you where the places to charge are. There are many around Clinton, Mississippi, and Jackson, and uh, it's just not a problem. And if you're going on a trip, there's one that tells you where they all are. I mean, the whole thing, all the way from here to L.A. or something. So that part's not a problem. Of course, having to go there and then wait to charge it up, that might be a problem. So I don't know if I'd drive across the country on all electric, but it can be done. In other words, there's plenty of places to find out where the places are online. you got to travel leisurely, and uh, they need to have these charging stations at scenic overlooks or right. the Grand Canyon or, I don't know, some place where you want to stop and spend some time. But, Alec, thanks for sharing that with us. Thank thanks, you. Alec. Bye-bye. All right, Casey, we've only got uh, about 90 seconds left. The rain-sensing wipers. Now, this is something that is on my new car, and I don't know that I'm crazy about it because I just have never found an interval wiper that suits me. Tell us what's a rain sensing wipers. So it has a sensor usually made it up to the windshield right behind the, usually behind the rear view mirror. And it will actually detect those raindrops optically. And then it'll turn your windshield wipers on and put them on an appropriate speed. Um, most, most of the new cars I drive now have some version of that. My 2009 smart car even has rain sensing wipers on it. And, and I'm the same way. When I first, when I first got it, it would, it would come on at weird times. It would go on weird speeds and it would drive me kind of crazy. Um, but over the years, I've gotten used to it, and I, I, I appreciate it. It's, like, it's just one less thing to worry about when you're driving. And one thing that I hope will revolutionary driving, revolutionize driving is the driver attention monitor. Uh, so many people, they're not necessarily drunk driving. They're drowsy drivers. And how does this attention monitor work? So most of them, they have, they'll monitor the steering inputs, and they can they can determine a profile of what's an awake driver and what's a sleepy driver, depending on how much you're steering with the car. So that's that's usually how they do that. Um, but again, you know, we talk about like the super cruise system for GM. There's a there's a camera that monitors you for paying attention. So you you can do it with vehicle inputs. You know, are you are you are you pressing the accelerator? Or are you steering the car? And they can detect that, or even a camera can go could be put in. KC, we love having you on the whole show, not just for our regular one minute. Thank you so much for partnering with us and coming on the show today. I love it always. Thank you so much for having me anytime. That's going to wrap up today's AutoCorrect. Thank you, Kevin Farrell, for being our call screener. Thank you, Jay White, for being the board engineer. For Coach Charlie Milton, master technician, who gets back from his fishing trip next week. I'm Liz Gill. Thank you for listening to AutoCorrect on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public.